Well, as I've said this evening, we're continuing in John's Gospel. We actually don't have very far to go uh, before we reach uh, the end, and this evening we're going to bite off a, a significant chunk of chapter 21, and that is our Lord's third appearance to His disciples at the uh, Sea of Tiberias, or basically the Sea of Galilee. And again, the time frame being uh, after the resurrection of Christ, of course, but before the Great Commission, before the day of Pentecost, what is it that the disciples are doing? And at first glance, it may appear that they've kind of gone off the rails, going back to their old, old vocations instead of moving ahead, but actually we'll find that they were doing what they needed to do, uh, and the Lord was providing through what they were doing and setting things up for what it was He was about to call them to do. So let's read the text, first of all, in John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus manifested or revealed Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And He manifested Himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, do you, not have any, or you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right, the right hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and when they were not able to haul it in, or well, then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon, Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, "'Bring some of the fish which you have now caught.' Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after He was raised from the dead. Well, may the Lord show us what He would have us to learn from this text this evening. And actually, we may be surprised there's quite a bit uh, to learn in this text. Now, remember this morning we were reminded of how the Lord showed His disciples many more signs to strengthen their conviction that He had been raised from the dead uh, because He was about to send them out to be the witnesses of the resurrection, He wanted to make sure they had a very strong conviction that that had actually taken place. So the Lord didn't give them a little evidence, He gave them a lot knowing it would strengthen their ability to witness for Him. Now this evening we see another one of His appearances which certainly qualifies as one of the signs that the Lord gave to them, although John had noted earlier, these he had performed in the presence of his disciples, not publicly, and they were not included in the book. Even though that is the case, this still would qualify as one of the things that would strengthen their conviction that Jesus was, in fact, alive. Now, it is interesting to compare this particular appearance of Jesus, the timing and the circumstances of it, with his previous ones. Remember, his first and second appearances were actually on the first day of the week, the first time when Thomas was absent, the second time a week later when he was present. Now, the first time that he appeared, they didn't yet believe that he had been risen from the dead, and obviously the second time they did. 
Now, it's interesting, Matthew Henry in his commentary believes that the second time Jesus appeared to them on the first day of the week when they were together was actually a gathering together to worship the Lord, that this had basically been the start of their observance of the Lord's Day. Remember, we we noted before that Jesus made appearances on the first day of the week to begin to establish a new pattern, uh, a new day for worship. It wouldn't be the old covenant Sabbath, which commemorated the uh, completion of the work of the first creation, uh, which was destroyed by sin, but rather one that would commemorate the work of the new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the first day of the week being the day when He entered into His rest, when His work was completed and He rose again from the dead. Perhaps they began to understand that. Uh, Certainly, this is the second time they were together on the first day of the week. Now, if that is, in fact, true, and even if it isn't, I think we can assume that this third appearance was not on the Lord's day, because this time they weren't together uh, worshiping, but they were together fishing. And I think we can also assume that they would never have done this on Saturday, which was the Old Covenant Sabbath, because of what their neighboring uh, Jews would think. Uh, They would be persecuted by them and um, uh, perhaps it would make it more difficult for them to do their work. As a matter of fact, we do find, like Jesus, that the disciples, as they went around evangelizing, would often go into the synagogues on the Old Covenant Sabbath when the Jews were gathered to worship in order to try to reach them with the gospel. So this took place sometime during the work week. Now, this also happened, I believe, uh, I think it's indisputable, before He gave them the Great Commission. Because after He gave them that commission and ascended into heaven, before He did, before He ascended, He commanded them to go to Jerusalem and to wait there until they received the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, they're not in Jerusalem. They're at the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had not yet ascended. So this is that interim period. And one final thing to note is what Jesus did at this particular appearing. He not only showed Himself again to them as one who was alive, who was raised from the dead, but on this particular occasion, He actually, in His mercy, reaches out to provide for them, to minister to their needs as He had done throughout His ministry. So this is an act of mercy, and it is our Lord's continuing care for His disciples, even at this particular point in his ministry where he's moved from that state of humiliation to that state of exaltation. He hasn't reached the pinnacle because he hasn't ascended yet, but he is still on or in that particular phase. So let's take a look at this account to see uh, what we can learn from, from this. Now, first of all, we see where the Lord appeared to them, and John tells us it was at the Sea of Tiberias. We read in verse 1, after these things, Jesus manifested Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and He manifested Himself in this way. Uh, Some commentators have pointed out that the the time frame references that John was using were actually those uh, according to the Roman calendar rather than the Jewish calendar. And I think here we see another indicator that John was writing to include a Roman audience because of the name he uses for this particular body of water that they were fishing out of, the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias was actually the name that the Romans gave to what the Jews called the Sea of Galilee. Now, realizing that this takes place at the Sea of Galilee, it shouldn't be at all surprising to us that Peter... And as we're going to read in just a moment, the two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, would would be there and that they would be doing what it was they were doing because this is what they were doing and this is where they were when our Lord Jesus first called them. And let's not forget that Peter's house was also in Capernaum, which is basically one of the cities built on this sea. So it shouldn't surprise us that the disciples were there and that they were doing what it is they were doing because that was at least the trade of of many of them before Jesus called them to become fishers of men. 
Now, secondly, we see who these are that Jesus revealed Himself to. We read in verse 2, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of His disciples were together. Now, we should note here that there were seven this time rather than eleven. Remember, eleven would be the complete number now that Judas was gone. We see there was Peter and Thomas, Nathaniel, the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two others who are unnamed. Now, notice first of all that there is a name that pops up here that we haven't actually seen since chapter 1, and that is Nathaniel. We don't really read anything about him throughout the entire gospel except when Jesus first encounters him. Remember Jesus, when he saw Nathanael, said, here is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And then when Nathanael says, well, how do you know me? And he says, well, before Philip called you, when you're under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael says, you are the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, because I told you you're under the fig tree, do you believe? You're going to see greater things than this. Well, the question we really need to ask is, what has Nathaniel been doing all the way between chapter 1 and now chapter 21? Well, actually, if you recall back in chapter 1, which was nearly a year ago, we saw that Nathaniel is actually one of the 12 disciples. He had another name, and that name is Bartholomew. Uh, Bartholomew, when you stop and think about it, is actually what we might call his last name. Uh, what was his family's name. Remember, Peter was called Simon, and Jesus gave him the name Peter, which means, you know, rock. Uh, but Barjona was his family name, uh, Simon or Peter, uh, the son of Jonah. Well, Bartholomew basically means the same thing. Bartholomew means the son of Tholomew, or actually more, more accurately, the son of Talmai. So this would be his last name. Nathaniel is his proper name. And that being the case, Nathaniel had been with Jesus for those three and a half years. So it shouldn't surprise us that he pops up here. And notice also who was present this time, and that is Thomas. Remember, Thomas was the one who missed the first appearing of Jesus and the one who said, I have to see him with my own eyes or I'm not going to believe. But let's not forget the other disciples also didn't believe until they saw Jesus with their own eyes, so we can't fault Thomas for that. Uh, we see Thomas here, and we see the Lord appearing here to strengthen Thomas, I think, making sure that Thomas was present so he wouldn't miss another appearing so that Thomas's faith would be strengthened because he too was going to be one of those witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And maybe from Thomas's perspective, maybe he wanted to stay close to the disciples so that if Jesus did appear again, uh, he wouldn't miss out as he had before. It's always disappointing to miss out on any of the blessings that the Lord sends our direction. And when that happens, we should do our best to make sure that we don't miss out the next time around. Well, we see here again that Jesus, after He was, well, after He was raised from the dead, and we see that the, what the disciples were doing. They had worked together for such a long time, and now they're continuing to work together. Now, that shouldn't surprise us, should it? Because they spent three and a half years basically sharing the road together, uh, being the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, and now that they have spent that much time together, I would imagine that they seem to one another to be as close or closer than their natural family. Shared experiences, I think you all understand, shared experiences tend to bind us together, especially when we're able to work together for such a great cause as this. And they had certainly been working on the greatest of causes and had shared a great deal of time together. I think our Lord intended that this be written down as an example to us and as an encouragement for us to do the same thing. There's really no better way for us to grow together and to grow in our love and our care and concern for one another than that if we work together or labor together for 
his cause. Several years ago when um, Don and I were first married, we had the opportunity to go on, uh, you might say, an evangelistic kind of a vacation with a church group, although it was in a real rough area called Hawaii. Uh, we, um, we spent half of that time basically going out on the street and inviting people to come to an evangelistic outreach. Uh, we did a lot of other things together as well, but the interesting thing is having spent that time that week, or actually it was more like 11 days with those people and having worked together with them uh, to invite people to come to this crusade, it really had a way of cementing us together uh, in a way that we really hadn't experienced before. Uh, we also had the opportunity to do a lot of street evangelism down in San Diego, which is where we lived, and sharing that experience together just really bound us together for quite some time. Now, it's not super glue, it's not permanent glue, unless, of course, we're all in the Lord Jesus Christ, which we are, but it sure goes a long way to making us one when we can work together in this way. Now, Jesus chose to reveal Himself to them at a time when they were all together, and certainly it's because He approved of what they were doing, working together still fellowshipping together in the work that they needed to do, and we're going to see a little bit more about that in a moment. But he also appeared to them together because he wanted them to be witnesses of this event so that they could corroborate each other's testimony that they had seen the Lord. Now, here's another interesting thing. There were seven of them that were present. Uh, this is another indication that that John, at least, uh, was providing evidence to a Roman audience that they would accept because according to Roman law, the, uh, basically the, the truth of certain events would be established by no less than seven witnesses. So I think it, it's interesting uh, how that works out. It's not just by chance that there were seven here. Now, third, we see the circumstances under which Jesus revealed Himself, and that is while they were fishing. We read in verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to Him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now, why were they fishing? was, you know, maybe they were fishing uh, because they had nothing else to do. Maybe they didn't want to be idle, and maybe they understood, but we also very well understand, and that is when you have nothing to do, then you open yourself to Satan's attacks because that is usually when they are the strongest. If we're moving forward with purpose, then we're going to be less distracted by other things. But when there's nothing to do, then just about anything can take hold of our attention. Well, maybe they were doing that because they didn't want to be idle, or maybe it was because they needed to fish to meet their needs. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Now, it's likely that while Jesus was with them during those three and a half years, during the time of His ministry, that all of their needs were being provided for by others, by those who were following. We, you know, it wasn't like the Apostle Paul who was making tents wherever he went to provide for his needs and those with him. Jesus and his disciples were basically doing the work all the time. And Jesus, if he wasn't providing food supernaturally, which he wasn't all the time, they were being provided for by, as Luke tells us, the women who had the means to do it uh, who also, uh, at least at times, were traveling with them. But now that Jesus had died and He was raised again from the dead, they had to go back to meeting their needs the way they used to, and that is by working. So I think we need to understand that this was not disobedience on their part. They weren't sinning here. There wasn't something else that they should have been doing. When Jesus appears, He doesn't rebuke them for fishing. Remember, Jesus had not yet given them their commission. When He gives them the commission, then He ascends and, and He tells them to wait in Jerusalem, and there's really only a few days left, at most ten, before the descent of the Holy Spirit, because there's 50 days between uh, Passover and Pentecost, and Jesus made these appearances over a period of 40 days. 
Now, we might even eliminate some of that time by the three days He was in the tomb, which means there may have only been seven days left between the time Jesus ascends and the time the Holy Spirit descends. But this is that period, that 40-day period where Jesus is appearing to them. So He doesn't rebuke them, but they are still waiting for the commission. They're still waiting for Jesus to give them their marching orders. Uh, they're still being built up by the Lord Jesus as He appears to them. And so there is this waiting period. And again, it reminds us that until we have clear direction from the Lord, and until we are endued in, in, in with His power, we really should not try to do something just because we think it's a, a good idea. They were waiting on the Lord. But notice, they had fished all night and caught nothing. And this reminds us that it is possible to work hard, to put a lot of effort into something, and still get nothing for our trouble. As a matter of fact, we're going to find that in the world, that's the way things generally are. But it's also the way that the Lord often prepares us to receive His coming to us in blessing so that when He does come, we can clearly see Him. Again, the example J.C. Ryle gives in his book, uh, Great Christian Leaders of the 18th Century, that's exactly what he saw the Lord do, letting England get very dark before he raises up this great light so that it becomes more conspicuous. People can see it more easily. The Lord is here and is doing this work. Now, fourthly, we see how the Lord Jesus revealed Himself. He came to them in the morning after a fruitless night's work. We read in verse 4, but when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Matthew Henry has a very helpful comment here, which I think is extremely encouraging. He, he writes this, Christ's time of making Himself known to His people is when they are most at a loss, when they think they have lost themselves. He will let them know that they have not lost Him. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes if Christ comes in the morning. Now again, this can be very encouraging to us, especially if we are those who have been putting a great deal of effort into the Lord's work. If we've been working long and hard and yet have not seen the Lord bless our work, just at the time that, that we're at our wit's end and are ready to give up, the Lord comes in His blessing. Now, Jesus this time did not come to them walking on the water, but He was standing on the shore, even though the circumstances were very similar to the time when He actually did. But the reason why He was on the shore and didn't come to them is because they were coming to Him. They had fished all night and they were on their way back to the shore. And notice that when, when they were on their way back, Jesus didn't stand at the shore and say, hey, look, guys, it's me. He didn't tell them who He was, but He revealed Himself in a very gradual way. Now, Jesus at this point was close enough where He could be seen. At least they knew there was somebody that was there on the shore, but He was far enough away so that they couldn't yet recognize who He was. I don't think there was any... Um, you know, any miracle here, like there was on the road to Emmaus where Jesus basically hid Himself from those two He was speaking with, because we understand that He was about a hundred yards away. It's hard to tell who somebody is when they're a hundred yards away. It's also clear that the disciples weren't apparently expecting to see Him. Sometimes the Lord draws near to us, but we don't see Him because we're not expecting Him. We're not looking for Him. I think we need always to be looking for Him. That's what the Lord would have us to do. Now, the way the Lord chose to reveal Himself here was through an act of mercy. We read in verse 5, So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered Him, <laughs> No. <laughs> um, now, notice how Jesus speaks to them with, with the tenderness of a father. He calls them children. And I think here is where we begin to see again that even though Jesus had moved from His state of humiliation, uh, He who was above all humbled Himself to become the servant of all, 
even though he was on his way to the throne of God where he was going to be crowned with power and authority over all creation. And I, uh, well, I think it was even his before he ascended the throne. He still spoke to them with as much kindness and love as he had before. Now, I think this is important to see because what it means is that even though Jesus is exalted and even though he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he still loves and he still cares for us as his children and considers us his children. And as we're going to see, continues to care for us. Now, Jesus knew that they hadn't caught anything. I mean, he knew that was already a fact. And the way that he asked the question actually shows us that because in the, in the original language, there's different ways of constructing questions, some that expect a negative answer, some that expect a positive answer. When Jesus asked this question, he was expecting them to say no, and you can actually see that from the English translation. Um, but we need to understand he didn't ask them uh, for his benefit. Do you have any fish you can give me? That, that's not what he was asking. Because when the disciples finally arrive at shore, they will see that Jesus had already prepared fish and bread. Uh, he had asked whether or not they had caught anything because he wanted to know what their needs were. Do you have any fish? No? And I, can, I, I kind of chuckled when I said that because you can just imagine <laughs> fishing all night and coming back empty. What kind of a no that probably was? No, we don't have any fish. <laughs> we wish we had fish, but we don't have any fish. But again, I want us to see here that since they didn't have fish, Jesus was ready to meet that particular need. Now, Jesus not only cares for us spiritually, He also cares for us physically, and we know that He does. If we don't have what we need, all we need to do is ask Him and He will provide. And by the way, since Jesus is also our example, we should learn from His example to be concerned about the needs of the people who are around us, whether or not they have what they need. Jesus said, children, do you have any fish? Do you have what you need? And they said, no. Well, there's people around us also that don't have what they need. And as James reminds us, that our desire to meet the need of our brethren, and I believe John also reminds us in his first letter, if they don't have what they need, that our desire to help them needs to go beyond desire to actual action, beyond well-wishing to meeting those needs. If James says, if, if, if you say to them, be warm and be filled, he says, what good is that? Well, it's no good. If we have the means to help them, we should help them. And we should remember also what Solomon writes in Proverbs 19, verse 17. One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. Whenever you help somebody who is in need, the Lord, well, Solomon says you're actually lending to the Lord, and the Lord is going to pay back. He is going to make it good. Well, again, when Jesus asked the question, they answered him, no, we don't have any fish. And it may likely be that they were frustrated by the fact that they had worked all night and had caught nothing. And again, we've seen Jesus didn't ask because he didn't know, but he asked because he wanted to know what their need was and he, I mean, he knew it, but he wanted them to acknowledge it before he acted to meet that particular need. Now, I do think that that also is true of us. The Lord would have us to acknowledge our need of Him and what He has to offer before He comes to meet our needs. He wants us to express those needs in our dependence upon Him. So we don't have to suffer in silence. The Lord tells us, you have not because you ask not. Ask and you will receive if you simply call upon the Lord. Well, then Jesus revealed Himself after He asked this question. He revealed Himself through a very familiar miracle, which was one that the disciples should have immediately recognized because it happened at the very beginning of their ministry. We read in verse 6, And He said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. They should have, that should have cued them in right there. So they cast, 
And then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Now, Jesus here tells them what to do. He gives them a command, and He also gives them a promise. Cast the, the net over on the right-hand side of the boat, and if you do, you will have this great catch. Do as I say, and you will find. Now, Jesus could make this guarantee because He is the Lord, and He had control over all things. Um, it's not because He could see where the fish were, but because He commanded the fish to be there. When they cast the net, they probably swam into the net. So he is in control of the fish of the sea. He's in control of all things. And that should give us, of course, great confidence. Now, the interesting thing is the apostles still did not know that that was Jesus. And yet they obeyed him. <laughs> they didn't even know who it was that was commanding them and who had made this promise. But maybe they were so frustrated that they were willing to try anything at this particular juncture, take anyone's advice to see if it would work. But when they obeyed, Jesus did as He had promised. Again, when we submit to the Lord Jesus, when we do what He calls us to do, He will bring blessing as He has promised. Even if the blessing is a long time in coming, the Lord will do it. As Paul reminds us in Galatians 6 verse 9, if we continue to sow in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now again, this was another miracle, another sign that was meant to show them who it was that was speaking to them, a miracle that points to the risen Lord. Jesus was alive. It also demonstrated that all authority had been given to Him. But let's not forget that this was also an act of mercy. Jesus not only appeared to them again in order to confirm their faith, but He did it in such a way that He was providing for their needs. He gave them what they needed to take care of themselves, and He gave them even more than they needed. Remember what Jesus said, uh, says in His Word, what He will do for us if we would basically give up everything uh, and take up our crosses and follow Him, He said that He would provide for us, He would care for us, and He will. And we need to believe that He will. Um, again, if we have not faith, if we don't believe, if we doubt, we can't expect to receive anything. But if we believe the promise of Jesus, when, when He says give up everything, remember that doesn't mean in every circumstance that everybody, all of us, need to give up everything we possess, and then somehow hit the streets and begin evangelizing. But what it does mean is that we do need to see that everything the Lord has given to us belongs to Him, and He has the right to require it of us whenever He wills. But if He wills, we should give it freely and know that He's going to take care of us, such as what He did with um, Dave and Rochelle Robbins when He called them to basically pack up everything and, and move to Africa. Uh, they gave up all the comforts they had here, and they went out to Africa looking to the Lord to provide for their needs as they are doing now what the Lord has called them to do. Now, this also may have been a picture, this catching all these fish, may have been a picture of what the Lord was about to do through them. Remember before, during the ministry of Jesus, they had gone out fishing for souls. Jesus said at the beginning of His ministry, "'Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men.'" And yet, during the time of their ministry, they caught relatively few. Maybe this was to show them that they were on the eve of a great revival in which they would cast out their nets and bring in thousands of souls to Christ. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 were converted through one sermon, quite a bit different than the time of Jesus' ministry. Now was going to be a time of great encouragement. And here is another encouragement for us to keep persevering in what the Lord has called us to do and to wait on Him for the blessing. Now, fifthly, we see how the disciples received His appearance. We read in verses 7 and 8, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. 
But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. Now, notice that John was the first one who recognized that it was Jesus. John seems to have been perhaps a bit more intelligent, a little bit more perceptive. But it may also be because he was the one whom, who, who loved Jesus. Remember the disciple who loves Jesus. They all loved him, but, and the one that Jesus loved. And he was the one who stuck closer to Jesus throughout all of his trials, more than the rest. I mean, when Jesus was crucified, where were the disciples? They had run away. They were hiding except for one. And he was at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother, which is why Jesus addressed that disciple and basically said, you should take my mother into your household. Well, Jesus revealed himself to John first. Now, when John saw who it was, he said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, I think he specifically told Peter, knowing that Peter would very much want to know. All the disciples, I'm sure, wanted to know, but Peter in particular, because, again, of Peter's great love for his Lord. Peter had already seen the risen Lord. Peter already knew that Jesus had forgiven him for his denial of him those three times. And Peter had received his mercy and his forgiveness and knew that Jesus loved him and he loved Jesus. Now, John was quicker to see Jesus, but note that Peter was more zealous to be with Jesus. And as soon as he realized that Jesus was near, he couldn't wait for the boat to reach shore, so he immediately jumps into the water and begins to swim. And of course, not wanting to meet Jesus <laughs> in his loincloth, before he jumped into the water... He put his outer garments on. Now, we need to understand being stripped for work, sometimes I think in the King James Version it says he was naked, but he, he wasn't, okay? They, they would strip themselves down to a loincloth. Why did Jesus put on the outer garment, which would have made it much more difficult to swim to shore? I mean, it's a lot harder to swim when you're fully clothed than when you're wearing swimming trunks. Well, he did that because he wanted to honor his Lord and didn't want to show up basically stripped for work. He wanted to show up with his outer garment garment on, even though it would make it harder. Now, I want you to notice, too, that the rest of the disciples didn't jump in after Peter and begin to make their way to shore. Uh, instead, they began to make their way to shore in the boat with the fish that Jesus had provided, but that doesn't mean that they loved Him any less. If they all jumped in and swam to shore, what would have happened to their fish? And if Peter had stayed on the boat, would Jesus have been as pleased with him as he might otherwise have been? Now, this is simply to say that we all have different ways of showing Jesus that we love him. And Jesus will accept it if what we do for him is done out of a heart of genuine love. Remembering, too, that it has to be within the boundaries of his word. We can't sin and say, accept this Jesus. He won't accept that. But when we seek to do what He calls us to do, whatever it is we seek to do out of genuine love, He will receive, even if it happens to be different from what our other brother or sister may do to show their love. He will accept us. Now, sixthly, we see what the Lord did for them after they came ashore. We read in verse 9, so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus had prepared a meal for them, and when they arrived, they found a warm fire and fish and bread. Again, Jesus knows what we need, and Jesus provides for our needs. Jesus also asked them for some of what they had caught, and they gave it to Him. We read in verses 10 and 11, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Now, Jesus didn't need their fish. Jesus already had prepared the meal for them. But He told them to bring what they had caught because He wanted them to enjoy the fruit of their own labor that the Lord had blessed them with. And actually, it is a blessing not only to be able to bear fruit, but to be able to enjoy what it is that the Lord has blessed us with for that work, according to what the psalmist says in Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2. 
How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. When you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy, and it will be well with you. I think Jesus also wanted to show them what was in store for them in His kingdom, that He would, as He had promised them in one of the other Gospels, that He would eat with them, and they would eat with Him in the kingdom of God. And so they obeyed the command of the Lord. Uh, they weren't able to haul this net into the boat because there were so many fish, but they were able to drag it to shore. And Peter was the first one to go out and drag the net to shore. Again, we see the impetuousness of Peter. Sometimes it's a blessing, sometimes it isn't a blessing. But he was always the first to line up and do what the Lord had called him to do. That was just his nature. But I do think there are some advantages to having that kind of a heart for the Lord and not always kind of holding back, waiting for just the opportune moment. Sometimes we just need to break through and do what He calls us to. But then they counted the fish, and there was 153. I don't think there's any spiritual meaning behind the number of fish here. Maybe they counted them because they were going to divide them up among them. But regardless, they had what they needed. And they could sell the excess. By the way, these were 153 large fish. Jesus didn't give them minnows. He gave them substantial fish. But they could take these fish and they could sell them. And with the money that these would provide, they could go to Jerusalem, which is what Jesus was shortly going to command them to do after He ascended. So here is another way in which our Lord provides for His people so that they can carry out His will. And then finally, we see Jesus invite them to breakfast. We read in verses 12 and 13, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question Him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. Almost sounds like a repeat, doesn't it, of the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000 where Jesus not only fed everyone who was there, but He also took care of His disciples, and here He is taking care of them again. But again, notice, Jesus was treating the disciples as His friends. Now again, as we saw in the past, in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, He didn't sit down and say, you now wait on me, bring the fish, bring the bread, and feed me. He didn't ask them to wait on Him. He waited on them. He again served them. And I think there's a very important point that we need to see here with regard to this example that Jesus gives us. That when the Lord gives us gifts, or particularly authority, He doesn't intend that these things to be used to lord it over others but He intends that we use these things to serve others. And here's, here's a couple of examples. Why did God make the angels to be greater in might and in power than, than we are? Well, it's because the Lord intended that they would be our servants in the work of salvation. They are ministering spirits, the author to the Hebrews tells us, that are sent out to minister to those who will inherit salvation. They need that power in order to serve us. The husband is given authority over his wife. Why is he given that authority? To lord it over his wife, to make her do what he wants her to do so that she will wait upon him? No, but the Lord says that we might care for her. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's why we have that authority. That's why he made us stronger at least in most cases, stronger than our wives so that we might actually minister to them as Jesus ministered to us. Jesus became a man, not so that He might be served, but to serve so that we might be saved. And He has left that to us as an example that we are to follow in our various relationships. And again, the fact that he shared this meal with them was simply one more way that he was demonstrating that he was no mere spirit that was appearing to them. He had risen bodily from the dead. Peter is later going to use this event as the evidence of that very thing. 
He ate with us. He sat with us. He has risen from the dead, and that before Cornelius, as we saw this morning. Now, John concludes in verse 14, this is now the third time that Jesus was manifest to the disciples after He was risen or raised from the dead. Now, this was the third time that Jesus revealed Himself to His disciples collectively, at least when they were together in some kind of group. He did make other appearances to confirm to them that He had risen from the dead and as we saw this morning, to strengthen their conviction because of the work that was laid out and that was set out ahead of them. Now, as I reminded you this morning too, as John reminded us, this also serves to prove to us the same thing, that Jesus is alive. And we are to use this eyewitness account to demonstrate to others, in fact, that that is true. And I do believe we can also tell them not only that Jesus is one who is able and willing to save us from the consequences of our sins if we will only take hold of Him by faith and turn from our sins, but He is one who will, if we will turn, take care of us and make sure that we arrive safely in heaven. That is the clear message of the New Testament Scriptures. So may the Lord take what we've seen, and I, I don't want to, it's been a long sermon, I know, but I want to try to review everything we've seen, but may He take the things that we've seen and encourage us that He does love us, He does care for us, He will be with us, He will provide for us. We don't have to be afraid, we don't have to worry. And the other thing I would just mention is, let's not forget that, yeah, we might have fruitless times where we do a great deal of work, we seek the Lord, we... Uh, we try to evangelize, we try to sow seed, and we don't see much of an effect. Let's not grow weary in well-doing because we will reap if we continue faithfully to sow. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and uh, silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've